Good afternoon. Welcome to our Coffee and Culture program. It's our regular Thursday afternoon program at 2.30 where you can come and you can hear a talk or you can see a film or maybe get a curatorial tour, uh, something related to our art gallery, archives, and museum. Uh, my name is Lori and I am an Education and Public Programming Officer here at The Rooms. Uh, as a reminder for everyone, I think you've got a blue sticker today, and that is good for a coffee or tea upstairs at the cafe. I see many people have already used their blue sticker, <laughs> I hope. Uh, if not, you can go up after the program and have a coffee or tea. Uh, today, we are fortunate, and we have a partnership program uh, for you today. Uh, it's presented in partnership with the Newfoundland and Labrador Archaeology Society. Uh, it's a brand new society, this is a new partnership for us. Uh, I'm going to introduce to you now the founding director and the current present, president of the Newfoundland and Labrador Archaeological Society, Tim Rast. He's an archaeologist living in St. John's, but he's originally from Alberta. I guess we kept him. <laughs> he has an undergraduate degree in archaeology from the University of Calgary, an MA in archaeology from Memorial University of Newfoundland. He's done field work in Alberta, Newfoundland and Labrador, and Nunavut. He's a flint napper and makes reproductions of artifacts through a small business named called Elf Shot. Some beautiful things. If you've never seen his stuff before, I'll do to the Tim. Thank you, Lori. Um, I'm going to introduce another Lori uh, in just a minute. Um, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the Newfoundland and Labrador Archaeological Society. Uh, you might not have heard of us before, and it is because we are brand new. This time last year, we didn't exist. This time last year, the province was one of the three provinces in Canada that did not have an archaeological society. And an archaeological society isn't a, a professional organization. It's not just for archaeologists or archaeology students. It's an organization that's open to everybody. To anybody that's passionate about archaeology, uh, that wants to be in touch with the, the archaeological community, uh, the, the society is open to everyone. We have some, some information, some, uh, some membership forms if you're, if you're at all interested in getting involved. Uh, we'll be doing regular talks like this. We have plans for workshops. We'd like to offer people uh, field and lab experience in archaeology. We want to uh, engage the, the public. Uh, with uh, with some of the really exciting archaeology that's going on in the province. So we're really happy that uh, we're invited to help organize uh, the, uh, this talk this uh, this afternoon. And uh, we had Scott Nielsen in uh, yesterday evening to talk about some of his work in Sheshashi, Labrador. Uh, this afternoon, Lori McLean is going to be talking about uh, some of his recent uh, Baothic archaeology work. And uh, Lori has been active in archaeology in the province since the 1980s. He's, he's been a fixture in the archaeology community here for more than four decades. Uh, he graduated from Mun with MA in 1989. His thesis was called The Baothic Adoption of Iron Technology, which was uh, summarized in a very small way in a, in a really handy guide to, uh, it's called the, A Guide to Baothic Iron. Um, he, uh, during the 1980s, he worked on uh, projects throughout the province, uh, Red Bay. Uh, um, in the 1990s, he became involved with the Burnside Heritage Foundation. I think he was probably instrumental in creating the Burnside Heritage Foundation on uh, uh, focus around the archaeology in the Eastport uh, area, the Eastport Peninsula, especially the Beaches site, one of the oldest sites we have uh, in the in the province. Uh, discovered in the 19th century. This is a Baothic and, and other cultures uh, lived there. And in the 1990s, uh, Lori discovered the massive Bloody Bay Cove Rhyolite Quarry, uh, one of the most incredible archaeology sites in the province and known throughout uh, Canada, uh, used for thousands of years by pretty much everybody that, that lived in the, the province as a source for stone tools. And uh, in fact, in 2011, uh, the beaches site and Bloody Bay Co Quarry were designated as uh, a place of provincial significance uh, by the province. <clears throat> uh, Lori's also directed the field school, Mon Archaeology's field school, uh, in 2011 and 2012. Um, and I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that he's one of our foremost, one of our only Baothic archaeologists, uh, uh, archaeologists working in the province right now. And uh, that's what he's going to be talking about today, some of his recent archaeological uh, survey work. Uh, so yeah, so please welcome Gordon McLean. Thank you, 
text him to find the intro. Try to live off that day. Uh, should I turn this mic on or we don't need it? Can everyone hear me? Should I turn this on? Yes. Okay. I'm a bit of a luddite when it comes to technology. How was that? Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the Biotic occupation of the Exploits Valley, Exploits Basin, some people might call it. Exploits Basin is a 260-kilometer uh, long uh, linear waterway consisting of the Exploits River, uh, Red Indian Lake, and Loyal River. But today I'll be talking mostly about, uh, well, I, will, I won't be talking about Loyal River at all. I'll be talking about the and, uh, and Red Indian Lake. Um, and what we know about that is that, of course, uh, as of the eight, mid uh, 18th century, it's uh, it's the uh, it's the uh, location of a significant biotic occupation. It's perhaps the well, it's it's the main biotic uh, settlement subsistence area within Newfoundland by the mid 18th century. And of course, that's a transition from the uh, previous uh, lifestyle that was mostly focused on the coastline with sporadic uh, you know, forays into the interior. Um, that's what we know in a nutshell. Um, we know what, and how we know that, uh, well, okay, but what I'm going to, I'm going to, it's not so much, today is not so much a summary and a description of that lifestyle as it is about, uh, I'm going to refer to that, of course, and hopefully it will work together. And I'm going to be talking a lot about the condition of the, uh, of the archaeological record today, because that's, that's very important in terms of uh, learning more about the beyond and also it explains about why uh, what we know is, is actually somewhat limited in a lot of ways. So we know that by the mid-18th century, the Biotic uh, were largely based uh, in the interior for most of the year. Big, big uh, difference from previous lifestyle. They were, uh, they had developed a different style, a, top, a style of housing that really doesn't kick in until they begin living in the, uh, the Exploits Valley. And what we call a house pit, as opposed to a uh, a wigwam or, or a less less substantial structure. Um, they had pretty well dropped the use of stone tools by the mid 18th century in uh, in favor of uh, recycling traditional uh, tool types, arrowheads, spearheads, uh, and other knives, perhaps from European iron and uh, mainly iron, and, and recycling other uh, European materials as well. And of course, the uh, the final big uh, change in the interiors that, that they're pretty well subsisting completely on caribou. So that's that's what we know in a in a very tight nutshell about the biotic life in the interior. Um, and what what we know about this uh, what we know is based on actually not not that wide a variety of sources. Okay, it's uh, it's uh, basically. Uh, when you're reading Ingeborg Marshall's book, a lot of people are familiar with it, The History and Ethnography of the Biotic. When you're reading Ingeborg's book, you can pretty well list out 16 significant episodes of uh, European descriptions of Biotic, sites in the interior, uh, and or encounters with Biotic. Okay? 16, 16 episodes between uh, 1767 and 1875. And four of those episodes, four of those historic references come from uh, after uh, well, three of them come from after uh, 1829, which is, uh, acknowledges the end of the Biotic period. So that's a fairly scanty, a fairly scanty historic record. Uh, archaeological research uh, into this topic begins in 1914 when Frank Speck, uh, who was not an archaeologist specifically, he was an American ethnologist, anthropologist. He uh, traveled up the Exploits River as far as in the lake, and he test pitted. He dug test pits at a lot of, uh, at a number of archaeological sites there, and recovered uh, uh, artifacts and information about the Biotic. He, uh, following uh, following Speck's research in the 1920s, Diamond Jeunesse, and, and then subsequent to him in the 1960s, Gareth Taylor. These guys were archaeologists who did uh, surveys, and both concluded that uh, erosion and damage from uh, fluctuating water levels, uh, largely due to the damming of the rivers, etc., had destroyed much, if not most, of the Biotic archaeological record. And they, so they couldn't, they basically they found very little archaeologically about the Biotic. But by, by 1960, uh, uh, a Grand Falls resident, Don Locke, embarks on his uh, personal amateur uh, archaeological, amateur archaeological program 
and for 20 years Don traveled throughout the uh, Exploits Valley. Uh, he was quite familiar with the country, apparently, and uh, found, identified a lot of sites that were previously mentioned by Cartwright and this map here, I'm going to describe very shortly. And so he, Don Locke found a lot of sites, found about 150 Beothic house pits, and dug a lot of them. Okay? And uh, so actually most of what we know about the interior of Beothic uh, archaeologically comes from, uh, from Locke's work. And that, that is very pertinent to today's discussion about the condition of archaeological sites in the valley because Slot being an amateur was, I think, was energetic, uh, but his, you know, his results are, um, they're not, we need, we need a lot more archaeology to, uh, to improve on our, on our scope of understanding there. Uh, basically, there's, there's been three professional excavations uh, within the valley. Uh, uh, Helen Devereaux dug a biotic house pit at Red Indian Lake, Indian Point, in the 1960s. Uh, um, Ray LeBlanc dug a site at uh, Wigwam Brook in the 1970s, and uh, Helen Devereaux dug a house pit at Pope's Point in the 1960s. So that's the professional input we have uh, in terms of excavation in the Exploits Valley. And the big thing that the professional uh, excavations uh, contribute is the, uh, is the faunal samples. And it was from those from thousands and thousands of uh, bones that these guys recovered in their excavations from Beothic house pits and other uh, Beothic features. They were 99% caribou bone, which for years, which was a big significant discovery, and uh, and uh, and we thought, okay, yeah, this is evidence for you know a major alteration in lifestyle, albeit a very limited uh, adaptation as well. Because if you don't get your caribou, basically you're, you're in big trouble. But I know that of recently now, uh, Peter Rowley Conway was a former prof here, who oh got way back in the 80s probably, uh, visiting from England. And he uh, he's a funnel. Uh, Archaeology, archaeological expert, and he suggests now that basically, even though the Beothic might have been fully dependent or you know attempting to subsist on caribou at the time, uh, you can't really do that. And so they were still subject to having to go back to the coast at time to, from time to time uh, for seals, birds, fish, uh, clams, etc. All these the diversity of uh, food resources that are available along the coastline. And this is actually, of course, uh, supported by the historic record. Which uh, shows Beothic on the coast of Notre Dame Bay as late as 1770 and into the early 19th century. And of course, the classic uh, case of Shanadithid and two other women being captured in 1823 uh, up in Badger Bay. So that's a quick summary um, um, of what we know about Beothic, very quick, and, uh, and just a quick discussion of the limited uh, basis of, uh, of uh, what we base those, this understanding on. And, uh, uh, so basically, uh, so we're going to talk about today. I've had the good fortune uh, to have uh, performed six uh, surveys. We'll call them, call them of the interior in the last five years, and uh, most of them are at the initiative of the provincial archaeology office. Okay, which uh, who had been monitoring the condition of these sites for at least 20 years, maybe 30 years, uh, monitoring the condition of them, uh, checking any erosion, damage from human development, etc., and. Uh, and doing the best they could to protect them. Uh, and um, so that's what I'm, what I'm going to talk today. This is going to bring that kind of program to life. And, uh, and, a big, uh, and at the same time, I'll be discussing the, uh, the potential for future research at some of these places as well. And I hope, like, so one of the things that will try to at least it'll describe kind of the nature of the resource that archaeologists deal with as we, uh, as we do this kind of research. And it'll, uh, it'll, this, this will show some of the problems that we face. So this is the map uh, re, uh, resulting from Cartwright 7068 uh, foray into the interior. As I said earlier, the, the first uh, historical reference we have to, uh, to uh, Europeans up the river comes from 1767, when two furriers traveled as far as right here, Sewell Point. This is one of the first uh, big falls along the river, and uh, Sewell Point being a Sewell is the uh, sea well, some people call them. These are like tassel type of uh, apparatus that the uh, Beothic built in conjunction with uh, deer fences along the river and ready to lay as, as they channel the uh, migrating caribou into, uh, into confined areas that uh, facilitates their harvesting. Them, okay? So this is Sewell Point. These two furriers traveled as far as here in 1767 and they, uh, they met or they discovered a bit of a Beothic uh, 
the canoe landing. There's a couple of canoes there and just some other uh, facilities that the record says, whatever that was, some other tools or whatever. And that was enough to frighten them. They turned around and went back. Right? So you're not far from the Bay of Exploits right here, obviously. Right? From the Bay of Exploits up to Red Indian Lake, it's about 120 or so kilometers, 170 or so kilometers. Uh, so um, these guys, but in 1767, the, uh, the Europeans and whatever were, uh, uh, unfortunately by then, the system of uh, the African European non-cooperation uh, was basically entrenched by then. And as the set, European settlement had spread along the coast from the, uh, from the Avalon up into Northern Bay and whatever, and the encounters had become more frequent, and uh, so the Biafra essentially had retreated to this area by then. And, uh, uh, so these guys saw a, a, a variety of Biafric uh, uh, artifacts or items, and that was that, it, that scared them. They went back to civilization. But in 1768, uh, uh, Governor Palliser uh, was concerned enough about the Biafric plight, we'll say, uh, he, he, uh, that he commissioned uh, Lieutenant John Cartwright to travel up the, uh, up the Exploits River, uh, attempting to establish peaceful contact with Biafric. Uh, uh, learn what he could about them, uh, do some surveying, uh, you know, they're always, you know, maybe this, this might have helped justify the trip, look, look for minerals, you know, gold or whatever, and, and, and if possible, uh, check out the possibility of a, of a route from Northern Bay to the south coast, south coast of Newfoundland. So Cartwright and 13 other men, including his brother George, uh, embarked from the exploits on uh, August 25th, 1768. And within a few days, they reach uh, Red Indian Lake. And it's Cartwright who calls it uh, Lieutenant's Lake at the time, after himself. <laughs> I guess, you know, <laughs> well, who's going who's gonna to contest the leader, I guess, right? And anyhow, they, uh, shortly after that, it's, it's Red Indian Lake. But uh, so uh, on the way up, up the river, he, he gives a pretty good description of the uh, of uh, Biotic uh, sites. He, he, he and his crew, they split into two groups of two. So one group went along here, the other group went along here. The, uh, these little dots here are, are biotic houses they record along the river. Okay? And there's also uh, deer fences and et cetera drawn in here, especially around Badger Brook, uh, the town of Badger. Uh, Pope's Point, a, a substantial site was here, and a bunch of other stuff here. Uh, and uh, yeah, so they, there's, and they, they noted 55 houses on the north bank and 35. On the uh, south bank, uh, there was about ten, eight or ten more on Red Indian Lake, and a few others they note uh, at a couple of ponds slightly off the main river en route, and a couple up around Charles Brook, which is up around here somewhere. So altogether, they note the presence of 102 houses, and most of them they describe as conical, conical, you know, which is uh, which is a very kind of a generalized description. I would think, uh, you know, I guess it's conical, and but the uh, uh, now we know that they were actually were probably more substantial and more varied than that, right? Uh, he, did, he mentions the presence of a couple of square ones. There's two or three square uh, houses at various places along the way, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> and those become more prominent uh, through subsequent uh, history. Uh, he didn't meet any Biotic on this trip. So this is a bit of a fanciful, you know, re uh, creation of, of of a Biotic camp. But he probably well, he did see the houses. All these vacated houses, that a lot of them were not that old, he suggests probably used within the uh, recent uh, season. And uh, by then, by 1768, Europeans were familiar with the unique shape of uh, the Arctic canoes such as this. So that's the map from 1768. This is a very useful document, and I, I would think that it was useful to, to a lot of the early uh, archaeological projects who uh, went up and down the river. This is, a, this is a slightly different version of the same thing. Right? Here's Again, here, these quivers of arrows, of Biotic arrows. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the first reference we have, the historical reference we have to this widespread uh, Biotic settlement along the Exploit River. It's a very intense uh, settlement. Uh, and this is uh, archaeologically, as I said, uh, begins, uh, we, we, we begin our research in 1914, Biotic sites. So this is the area we're talking about right here. Uh, Greece and Indians were the Biotic's uh, direct ancestors right here. So we have uh, the Greece and Indians are represented by uh, by uh, the little passage where the Biotic's immediate ancestors 
And uh, before the Little Passage, we have the, uh, the Beaches Indians. Little Passage are, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing, too, because it's not like, because, you know, like in, in 1497, the Little Passage don't immediately become Biotic, right? So for years after the initial historic period, the Little Passage continue doing their thing, but gradually uh, the stone tools that they make become obsolete. They, they change in shape, and they increasingly, especially in the uh, by the 17th century, they're uh, make, uh, recycling arrowheads, spearheads from iron and stuff. Uh, but before, so the little passage, so it's, even the dating is a little tentative. But so you can pretty well run them from about a, probably 1100 uh, AD up until the shortly after the contact period. And the beaches period goes back as far as 2,000 years ago, and and they just morphed into the little passage. Uh, they're so they're the same resident uh, genetic stock of, uh, as far as we can tell, Algonquin speaking uh, First Nations people, uh, just defined by different types of tools. And the analogy I have, I use for for people who you know it's like automobiles, okay? Like a 1960s Chevy is very distinct from a 1970s Chevy. By the same token, the uh, the uh, 14th century uh, little passage projectile point is completely distinct from the 18th century uh, beaches in the projectile point. And they're distinct again. Uh, the the, 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 biotic, the true biotic tools 200 years after, 300 years after little passage uh, ends are very distinct from the predecessor as well. So we have these uh, typologies of artifacts, of tools, or artifacts to us that fit within uh, uh, chronological periods. And I'm going to show you some of these. So this is some of the these are the sites we know about the came to those periods, and those are those grids are complements of the provincial archaeology office. Right? And uh, they have a lot of good stuff like this online that can be utilized. Uh, I'm going to show. I have a couple of pictures of of Mammothique replicas. Mammothique is the Biotic word for house, and uh, and I like to throw in the, these these replica shots because I'm going to talk a lot about house pits. As I mentioned earlier. Um, we know there were about 150 or so, 153 or so, Biotic house pits uh, identified along the Exploit River and Red Indian Lake. And uh, it's a very, it's a very abrupt adaptation from the coast because we have we have 32 house pits on the coastline from three archaeological sites. 18 were found at the beaches site, 11 were at Boyd's Cove, and three were at Inspector Island. And uh, uh, when John Guy describes Biotic houses in the in the early 17th century in Trinity Bay. Uh, he describes them as conical, skin-covered uh, structures for the most part. So that's that's a very big difference from, from these guys here. Why the Biotics started building these more substantial houses in the historic period is really unclear. It's uh, some people wonder if they if they copy the European model of uh, more uh, you know more uh, more angular square houses and whatever. Uh, it could be just a natural development of a of a better insulated house. But we call them house pits archaeologically because they uh, they consisted of a of a semi-excavated interior, and the earth from that excavation was mounted around the perimeter of the house and the superstructure. These are a little dark here. I've got a couple of better ones here. These are taken in, in uh, the superstructure was built. In, oh, in, let's go back to this one. The superstructure was built into the earthen wall that had been excavated. Right. These are from Red Indian Lake, Indian Point, and they're in a very dense thicket of woods and. Uh, and uh, and uh, thus limits the light, right? This is this one of these uh, the guys who built them might, felt might have been a, a vapor house. This one here being a lower thing, uh, where they got built a vapor bath by uh, uh, heating uh, stone in a fire, taking them out, and then pouring water over the over the heated rocks and creating steam. And of course, my wife and I were going through these just the other day, and I pointed out to her that there is a severe historic inaccuracy in one of these pictures. And does anyone know what it is? Yeah, my dog right here. <laughs> but she, she's a bit of a ha uh, you know, camera hound, camera hog, whatever. And uh, Biotic didn't have access to dogs, of course, which Whitburn points out in the 1612 or something, 1621. And, you know, he's, he's uh, remarking upon the plight of the poor Biotic who didn't even have the companionship of the dog, and, which is another reason why Europeans could uh, often uh, ambush them. With relative ease, I suppose. You know. So anyhow, that notwithstanding, these are other replicas. These are a couple that we built in Burnside at the beach site. Uh, this is a this one here is a 12 foot square structure. This is based uh, pretty closely on, on an excavation we did there. 12 foot square with the doorway facing the northeast. 
Uh, I really don't know the type of structure that was built over the pit because in Newfoundland we're not blessed with uh, uh, a good organic preservation of post molds and things like that. As you, when you read like a lot of reports from mainland archaeology, there's they often you know you can often see the distribution of the of the house or of the of the, of the of the wooden structure where the house stood in the ground because the post rock you can you can detect them by different colors of the uh, soil. In Newfoundland we rarely get that. Uh, so anyhow, so uh, we just we talked about and we decided to build this one. Basically, it's, it's just a bunch of upright poles as this uh, with a birch bark roof over it. Right? This one here is would have been the traditional type of house, which uh, I guess which Carter, George Carter describes these wind bombs as uh, basically six or seven feet in diameter. They're not a very big house, right? So these are all built of, covered in birch bark, um, and once again. One of the interesting things about these are that uh, these are very hard to find archaeologically. Uh, they're, they require much lesser material. They're very quick to throw together. They don't have an excavated interior, so you don't get that uh, telltale depression that, that that remains behind hundreds of years later to be out of the, the, the house. The house pit, the, the large ones, I'm sorry, fall down, and uh, they probably had a, like a tent ring, rocks around, and a hearth in the middle. But these are very hard to find archaeologically, and there's uh, and uh, to my, yeah, to my knowledge, no one's ever found a good one in, in, on the island. So that's what, so this is what I, and I show through this, this is what you keep in mind. Only for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about the uh, mammothiques, because uh, house pits, mammothiques, house pits. Because the house pits are the, um, are the prominent feature on these interior sites. And uh, some of them have just one house pit, others have up to uh, as many as 29. So when you, when you look at the sites, as I show you, and the, uh, and the house pits, keep in mind that this kind of structure, or even this kind of structure here. These are, yeah, these are pretty, these are nice little jobs. These are, uh, except these are visible at uh, just, just past the middle town in the interior. And uh, these are, you have to go to a boat to see these. And uh, they require annual maintenance. This is, uh, this, these are uh, topographic maps of, uh, of the structure we excavated at the beaches. I, I threw these in to show how uh, the pit is created. And uh, some of the outline of the Biotic House Pit of the Mount. Know. So here's the uh, what we did here. We basically uh, we measured the bottom. We measured as we excavated the uh, culturally altered soil, the black humus that results at a site uh, uh, due to human activities, cooking, uh, butchering, etc. Uh, that's the cultural area. That's where we tend to find the artifacts, and that's the cultural context for the given group period that we're that we're looking at. So what we did here, we excavated the, as we excavated all the cultural area, we, we took topographic measurements. So you can see here's a corner, here's a corner, the wall continues up here, here's another corner, another corner here. So this is a 12 foot square structure, here's the doorway, a nice path trodden uh, uh, deeply into the ground. Uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is oxidized soil that uh, resulted from a larger fire in this area, presumably within the house, that was used before the smaller uh, remnant hearth was left right here. This is a little hearth right here. This was, and this was a little surprising to me because uh, there's the hearth, you can see the hearth that we found here, this is at the deepest part of the house, right? So when we, you know, when you find these hearths in the interior and stuff, uh, as you'll see, there's always, a, there's, when they're not disturbed, there's a prominent mound left, you know, and you can see from the, from the grass, from the surface analysis of, of, a, of, a, of a manatee uh, rep, uh, remnant of a, of a house bed, you can see the hearth now. But this shows me that the Biak actually excavated the uh, the area where the hearth was used. Right? This is this is the deepest part of the house. And the other little depressions right here, these are probably the remnants of sleeping hollows that were that represent the uh beds. Okay, and uh, uh, as we know from the from the scant from the brief historical information we have, that the Biotic mode of sleeping consisted of. Uh, oblong pits around, around the fireplace and uh, covered with uh, spruce boughs and that's they curl up in a more or less a fetal position uh, with their heads often up on the, the bank. The, the inside of these houses, you know, presumably the, I think the walls would have been stuck here on the crest of the earthen wall. The, I mean the structure would have been stuck around here. So on the other side you've got to, you've got to slope down to the, to the exterior. Now you have the uh, structure, you have a slope down to the floor. Okay, so the, uh, basically they had their heads up on the bank, so a natural to the pillow. 
and their feet towards the fire. Okay. And the same map over here, same topography, but uh, this shows the distribution of artifacts within the structure. And uh, you see, there's not a whole lot. You know? and, but this one, this one was, I think this was probably the last one used at the beach site. So I think this was probably subject to reuse. So it's, uh, it's, this was a little, a little complicated. And another factor of this one was that uh, right around here, this was a big midden right around here. So I was wonder, I wondered why, and, this, and we've recovered a lot of animal bone around here as well, and even from the walls of the house, uh, mostly seal. 60% of the bone here is seal bone, very distinct from the interior. So I just throw in, these are uh, good representations of the house pit design, and how to be built. Okay, uh, what do we find inside those houses? Uh, just a couple of those. These are examples of uh, the little passage and Piotic arrowheads. Basically, this is a decent example of a, of a little passage of an arrowhead right here. Uh, the little passage had a uh, had a corner notch projectile point, such as this one. Uh, this this represents the transition because you can see it's got the beginning of a stem, right? Because the base, uh, into the historic period. The, uh, basically, the quality of the little passage type of stone tool at this declines. These drooping shoulders fade, and the uh, the optic points, the track points of let's say the post 1500s, uh, they become more asymmetric coming this way. The uh, the degree of uh, biofacial chipping, the degree of chipping each side of the item declines. The overall workmanship declines in the historic period. Look at this slide right here. You know? it's, uh, uh, very off, very asymmetric. And on the coast, you find these, you can find these in association with the iron, with modified iron, uh, European and other European goods in the, on the, on the, within the 32 coastal sites for the most part. One house at the beach site only had these guys in it and no European goods. In the interior, uh, the, uh, these are from Blue Model, which is uh, one of the sites uh, that contains one house bit in the interior, Blue Model near Grand Falls. But, uh, these are not from a house pit. These are recovered from a season in the external hearth uh, on, a, on a small island, so five kilometers from Grand Falls. Uh, but nonetheless, so I'm going to come back to these. So we get those in the, in the coast. We don't get these within the house pits in the interior, as far as we can tell. Uh, all of this stuff here, this is modified iron, except this guy right here. These are from, uh, from inland sites, and these are examples of the iron projectile points that the Biotic replaced uh, stone uh, items with. These are deer spears here. These have no counterparts on the coastline. So these seem to have been adapted uh, in conjunction with the uh, higher scale dependence on caribou hunting in the interior. These are up to 400 uh, millimeters long, very high quality, very nicely made. They're arguably, uh, this one here is especially uh, intricate, right? It's, the guy who made this one uh, also took the time to, it's got a bifacially beveled edge, it's ground. And it's all this ground on stone abrader that's the cold hammered or copper. So these are diagnostic of the interior. Uh, there's a claim that one unfinished item was from the beach site uh, in, in Bonavista Bay, but it's uh, it's been lost in the historic record. And uh, these come from these guys right here, from the fur trap, European fur traps, to the chagrin of the furriers. These two long pieces right here. The, uh, the spring, and I think it's the bird they call it on the bottom. Right? There's two long pieces that are up to about 400 millimeters long. So what they did was just cut off this uh, this buckle type of end on this one, and then they just start to cold hammering and grinding and hot work into the spring. Uh, so these, there's, there's not a lot of these. This is the main type of thing you get from the interior. These with a blade is similar size as these guys, but with a much smaller tang. Right? So these are modified from other parts of the traps. Uh, such as the pan right here, and, and the jaws and stuff up right here. And these are smaller again than these. These are similar to the ones you get on the coast. On the coastline, uh, you get uh, you get a fair bit of modified iron, especially from Boyd's Cove in Notre Dame Bay, uh, where Ralph Astori did a lot of work in the uh, 80s. And, but all of, the, all of the recycled iron on the coastline is, uh, comes from rock iron nails, which are uh, smaller, thinner diameter, uh, and rock iron is relatively easy to work. Uh, and that's the main recyclable product on the first one. And in the interior, they get more diverse range of projectile points, and they're using uh, a lot of traps and as well as other uh, iron items as raw materials, it's including some items like scissors, uh, which have uh, elements of steel, which are even harder to, to modify as well. 
Now, there's a number of uh, axes that are turned up at these interior biotic sites that were broken up by biotic modified, but these are cast iron and some wrought iron, and these are just the uh, these are harder to work, right? And I don't know if you get these are a lot thicker. Uh, I don't know if these are cast iron. Yeah, that's true. But some new to cast iron pots that are recycled, and uh, and uh, so these. I'm not sure what they were doing with these. It's hard to imagine them making arrowheads in these guys because they're so thick. And of course, the steel and the, the, uh, the blades that you hear cut off of this one, which gives them a rock iron, rock iron remnant that, that, that probably was easier for them to modify. So that's uh, that's the main kind of utilitarian material we get at these inland sites. Seventy-five percent of the biotic uh, artifacts in the interior. Seventy-five uh, percent of two thousand artifacts are, are iron, mostly rock iron. This is a uh, of these. There's only one found so far. This is an item made by Lieutenant uh, Buckins Armour in 1820 uh, when he was bringing the Nazdawitz remains back to Reading Lake. This the Biotic Lady who died uh, in 1819 or 1820 after being captured at Reading Lake. Uh, they, the, the expedition initially set out to return her to her people and hopefully initiate you know uh, peaceful contact whenever. But unfortunately, she died en route, and uh, so then the mission shifted then to a, uh, re returning her body to the interior. And so Buckingham had his armor make make these uh, iron projectile points. And interestingly, these are uh, you know uh, these are not as robust as the things the Biotic made. Very, it's a much more not surprisingly, it's it's a much more uh, I would say cheaper use of material, you know, because it, it's a uh, it's the, the tan here is very small scale, very slender. It cut off much more easily than the, the biotic things will. The blade is of a similar size as some of the ones I showed you earlier. And interestingly, this is the broad arrow, which is the trademark of the uh, of the British military, kind of stamped in there. So Vulcan had his armor on, made a, a number of these on um, on board their ship, and as they went up the up the river to the lake, they left these at a number of places that were known to have been frequented by biotic. And this one here apparently was collected at uh, at or near Pope's Point uh, in the late 19th century. So there were probably others, others of these around, but the, the, the one that's been found. We also find these pendants. This is from Wigwam Brook, and this is one that the uh, the fellow who found this one points out that to him, and this looks like an iron blade. And I agree with that. This, this could be because these these guys these guys have some degree of uh, you know symbolic uh, meaning. Um, you might hear that these are hips here with legs, you know, and uh, and whatnot. There are in, in a, lot of, a lot of the barrels I have in town have these pens in them. They're often stained heavily with red ochre. They'd be off the telltale material. So we get these inside the houses as well, even into the interior, into the into the 19th century. And also birch bark. We don't get much birch bark. <laughs> and uh, and in, in all the excavations I've done on the Arctic coast, we've never found anything made out of birch bark. It's very, it's much more delicate as you might. Uh, suspect, but this has been stitched along here. So this is also from Wigwam Brook, one of the bigger sites in the interior, from the Dunlop private collection that he turned over to the to the, to the province a while ago. Okay, so that's that's an introduction to to what hemispheres uh, represent. Okay, they represent the remains of those mammoths, and those are the kind of things we found inside the uh, inside the, inside those house pits. Uh, back to the, uh, the study area, if you would. This is the uh, Here's the Bay of Exploits. Here's the river coming up here. Here's Reading and the Inlet. Lake. The Boy River comes up here. Uh, I've had the good fortune, as I said earlier, uh, to have done a number of surveys of this area since 2009. And uh, in 2010, uh, some of the neatest ones were started on, on the uh, at the, uh, at the uh, on the initiative of the Provincial Archaeology Office. And basically, these arrows here point to clusters of biotic house pits. Okay? This is right in the lake here. This is Indian Point right here, which uh, seems to have had as many as 31, uh, at least 22 house pits, I'm sorry, 31 known from the whole lake. But in, uh, in 1875, Lloyd was here, TGB Lloyd, and he counted 22 biotic house pits right there. Uh, this is Noel Paul's Brook, right in Indian Falls, Pope's Point, and uh, Nimrod's Pool right here. So I'm going to talk about all these in sequence. And uh, since 2010, I've looked at uh, this one, this one, and this one. I did a small job here in 2011, but it wasn't a regional examination as these were. 
So our, uh, myself and, and some people who work with me, our job was to get in here. They weren't they weren't excavations as such, and so we don't have a lot of uh, we don't have a lot of information to you know to uh, to provide about what was inside the houses and etc. But my, our job is to get in here and basically determine the condition of these sites. As, uh, so let's say, uh, okay, how much time do I have? Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, and so our job was to get in here and uh, see how many house tips were left from the initial descriptions of these sites. Okay. And, uh, and it was harder than it sounds, actually, because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that a lot of these were recorded uh, by an amateur, uh, well-intended, no doubt, but basically um, his reports are inconsistent, his notes are inconsistent, there's very few photos, uh, they were all, the location was recorded without a GPS, and, uh, and some of the coordinates are wrong, as we learned, and some, some of the sites we found, some sites we couldn't even find, and uh, and so we did. So this is this is uh, this is a cluster around Noel Paul's Brook. There are six sites around here, and uh, four of them have house pits. And uh, and uh, as as the, the heading indicates, we found uh, six out of fourteen house pits. Here's the crew, 2010. This uh, Duce is a is an archaeologist from Finland. She worked with Don Pelly right here, and uh, Don's a, a, a res an editor who lives in Grand Falls. And he knows the river at like the back of his hand, I would say. He knows the location of a lot of these biotic sites. So he was, uh, he's worked with me on all of these trips. And they were worked with us on the first year, 2010. So this is, our, this is how we did it. We set out every day in Don's canoe and tracked down these sites. So we had the site record for coordinates on them. And so we, we had our GPS going, and we would just follow the GPS coordinates to the coordinates given on the site record forms. Sometimes they got us pretty close, and sometimes it didn't. As an example, uh, and with respect to the to the amateur archaeology, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's like I said, it's a problematic you know way of doing things. But uh, to be fair, if we didn't have that data, we wouldn't really, we would never find a lot of these houses today. Because this is just a, it's like a jungle going along here these days, you know. And like basically, when you're look, when I'm looking for archaeological sites, uh, surveying, you know, you, you really don't have the option of uh, of starting here and walking along here and digging a test pit every 10 feet or 20 feet or whatever something it just you're because after after like a month of that you're going to be from here up to about here with about 98 percent of your area not touched so what you tend to do what you tend to do is, is cruise along the coast of the river in your boat and you know anywhere there's a little clearing a little point where you can land a land vessel and on the coastline anywhere there's fresh water you'll stop there and have a look right so anyhow, this this is the glade site. There's one house pit uh, reported here, and we did we did rediscover a house pit here, and this is what they look like. Look at it. There's this is the earthen wall like that comes around like that, uh, and you can see it's tr it's tricky. What I've done, I just I've got a few pictures of the best ones actually, because some of them you they really don't you, they really don't show up. They're in the dense woods and stuff, and the features are hard to tell. But this is the glade site. This one this one bore out the uh, the site record form was out here. So that's what that one worked out. And this one, uh, this is another. This is a view from another perspective. Here's the uh, here's the earthen wall. And this one hasn't been. There's been a little bit of test work done in there a couple of years ago. A few iron things and whatever were pulled out. And uh, well, there's there's good work to do here. And then the part of our, my job here was to uh, was determine the uh, the threat to this to these as well. Okay. So that one there is well removed from the river. It's uh, it's not threatened by imminent erosion and whatever. Uh, here's the water line. Here's the edge of the bank. So this one is not in dire need of uh, salvage excavation or something we could say. So I mean, so then we move on to the next spot. And now there's this one here. This okay. As an example of the problem we faced, uh, we I said, so this is okay. Back to this story. This site here. Okay, there was there was another one. There's a similar site to this one, but a kilometer up here. And then we had the coordinates for it had one site and a little point like that and another one up over a hill like that. We could not find that site for, for not for lack of trying. And so and you know the funny thing about it is when I when I read the report stuff, uh, all the prior research has either had this one or the other one in a in a given year, you know. No one's ever found the two of these together. <laughs> well, I think they produced them. I think and it's not not to anyone's fault, not not to anyone's student, but I just think because they're very similar. 
And when you look at it, no one's ever found this one and one up there in the same year. And that's we had the same same results, you know. So that's and that, that's how it goes. This is an old pause. Uh, this is very near one I just showed you. There were five host bits on this one. Uh, we found one for sure. Uh, I say we found one out of five, but actually we found another four pits in, in an area where they weren't supposed to be. And when we tested them, we didn't find anything inside them. But when the guys tested the other four that we couldn't find, they found nothing either. So I may, we may have found the four that are not listed here, but they're just, they're not where they're supposed to be. So this is a, <laughs> so here they are standing in the middle of a house pit. Here's the wall coming through, this, the meter stick here is on the wall around like that. This big tree is growing out of the interior. And I, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find this this thing if you weren't, you know, if you weren't gifted somehow that to find this. It's a jungle town. We pushed in through it. And once again you can see especially this one, because it's well removed from the uh, from the edge of the island. Right? One hosted by itself. Uh, now there's no reference to more being here. Uh, so maybe there's no more but so we found that one and we didn't like say once again we we uh, we didn't do any digging here because we were fairly confident this was the one we were supposed to find. So we found that one and we moved on. And I'm, I'm just, I'm, like I say, uh, I don't have any, I don't have pictures of the ones that we did find. But basically, further about, oh, sorry, but a few, a few hundred meters this way on the same island, there were supposed to be four in the line here. Couldn't find them. But when I went further to another site, which was only supposed to have stone tools on the eastern end of the island, we recovered, we, we found that spot by the few stone flakes and stuff left on the surface. And a little ways over here, we found these other four depressions. So basically, I think these four here should be up here. Yeah. But uh, once again, uh, given the, the vegetation and et cetera, I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, get a shot of it. This is another spot. Uh, this was due south of the island I just showed you. Uh, we found three out of four here. There were three on the lower bank down here, and one was supposed to be up on the ridge, which rises above there. Here's, here's one that we found here. Here's the tree. The tree is growing on the wall. So the house here is the wall, the raised wall coming around like that. Like that. So of course, when the geography were living here, you, and the river, this, these are very close to the river, which is just out here. Uh, here's another one better to find. This is a rectangular structure. Here's the wall coming like this, like that, like that. And Aaron and Don are working right here. They're digging a test pit on a very shallow depression that we thought might have been another house pit. They found caribou bone there, so that's I'm good with calling that one another house pit, which is very, this is, doesn't show up that well, but this tree is growing in the middle of it. Up this ridge here, which rises a, oh, three to five meters above, above, there's supposed to be one house pit up here by itself, and we couldn't even get up on the ridge. The, the, the spruce and whatever are so dense that we could not, there's no way to, to get through it, let alone uh, check it for, for features. And here's the map of that site. This was a spot that would warrant some uh, immediate attention. This guy here was very close to the river when we were there in 2010. I would think this one is eroding by now. These other two are very close, to very near the river. These are well defined. These two especially. So uh, this is an example of a, of a spot where some archaeologists should get back to as soon as possible. And at least dig half of this house pit. Put in the grid, dig half of it, then you'll salvage the uh, the information about the structure, the artifacts that are there, et cetera. And then you've got the other nature to extend that. Uh, this is another site uh, within an old Paul's Brook cluster. Here's the walls like that. Very small spot. This one has a nice layer and a hearth in the interior. Uh, There's supposed to be two house pits here. We could only find one. But we did find a very interesting annex on this one, which might be the second one that uh, the initial report talks about. This is a, I call this a house pit at first. It's built directly adjacent to the other one, sharing a wall. But the interior is only about six square meters, right? But it's still, it's like it's 2.2 times two meters. Like, so there's enough room for, for even like uh, most of us to lie down in here, right? But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly small compared to most of the house. Pits. So maybe it's a storage structure uh, tacked onto this one over here. It's a unique little thing. You usually don't get them. You usually don't get them in that kind of proximity. Right? Usually, even if there was a storage structure or another one, usually they're a little ways over. Uh, anyhow, that's that's a good. That's, and you see, it's so much smaller than the actual pit. It's an actual right here. So this one is high above the river, not really threatened by the encroaching bank. But one problem 
up here. This is a well-used path that goes in from the little brook. It's called the little brook, and it tramps right across the corner of the house fishing patch. So this is another one that probably wouldn't hurt to get back to at least to monitor it. And if the tr if the path is uh, kind of increased, it's damaged, whatever. Well, someone should dig it. Then about three kilometers east of the Nopal's cluster, there's another uh, group of sites, six sites here, with which had 28 house pits. And these were interesting because these were the uh, at this at this within this cluster, the Red Indian Falls cluster, we did find house pits up on the upper terrace. Uh, as we were supposed to get a couple on the, the Noah Falls book, we were supposed there were supposed to be a couple on the upper terrace, but we couldn't get up there. But we were more successful here. And uh, one problem we had here was that the uh, the site record form, whatever shows this one, this is uh, these are mapped from the PAO, so this, these are once again uh, quality products by the buyer. <laughs> and uh, and uh, but this one is wrong, okay? Because we landed here. This cluster of six houses was supposed to be said we found three here. This should actually be up on this ridge up here, about nine meters above the water line. Right? So this one was a real. I patted ourselves on the back for finding this one. I'll show you. This is the first one we visited here. This looks. This is not a lot. Of, this is a little peninsula. It had four houses originally. It has three left there today. There's two nice and deep structures here. These are sharing a wall. These are side by side, similar to the, the one I just showed you from the Little Brook site. These are two uh, regular size, I'll say, house pits that were built side by side. There was another one a little ways up here that either had been uh, excavated by someone or eroded. It's, uh, there's a little bit of a depression you could see, but it was very near the bank and uh, was washing out. Okay. And then this is uh, this is probably the most enticing house pit left of this one. Here's, here's, this tree is growing right in the middle of a, of a house pit. And here's the earth model it's going around like that. Okay. And like I say, very little was known about this spot because it was subject to the to the very superficial, you know, uh, uh, examination by the by the amateur and by subsequent. This is the one upon that has the um, the tree upon the high bank. Uh, this one was a real problem because the the, uh, the location of the houses are meters away from where they're supposed to be. But there were supposed to be six houses there, you know, so we wouldn't we wouldn't give up on the spot essentially, you know. So there, you know, no one could imagine six house pits. So we, we kept up the search here. And this these are the three we found. And these are interesting as well because this one is a unique type of structure here. This, these are fairly big and uh, big hearth. And uh, one of these had about a thousand tree beans recovered from inside of it as well, which are unique, you know, beyond the house. The other shouldn't have tree bees, given that you know they had uh, negative interaction with your teams and whatever. But about from five sites in the island, we have uh, European tree bees, which at best are evidence that Europeans at least intended on trading with the or or befriending them. How they got them, exactly, we don't know. But this this top here, so here's the river out here. Here's the topo lines, about 85 meter topo interval right here, uh, nine meters above the river. And this is a very another very Difficult spot. It's, the trees are so dense here, you can see there's hardly anything growing in here. Right? Just brown humus and stuff on the floor. We're in here, this is the summertime, we're in here late July. And here's one house pit like that. One around here. Here's another, this is the big one with the, this one's sort of unique. This one has like a, almost like a raised sleeping platform, which is uh, characteristic of a Dorset Eskimo house, a uh, thousand or years, years older than these. Right? And so it has sort of like a three, it has the earthen wall, then it has a broad kind of initial level, then it adds to the interior floor, the normal floor, which has the heart and whatever. So this will this would be a nice one to get back to and uh, do some proper excavation, try to shed some light on. Just 100 meters from that other site, down over the bank, uh, there's another cluster, there's three house pits uh, in, in this alder thicket right here, very low to the river, and once again, another Pat on the back for finding this one because this is these are well, we had to work, work like dogs to get through these altars and stuff. You know, backpacks on. Here's the earthen wall coming around here. Now Don Pilly and archaeologist Greg Sports have been back to this spot and they cleared it. And I haven't seen it, but Don said this one shows up really well now. Apparently, is these show up like a, they're starting now? He says when the, they've cleared it, they cleared all the brush out of them and stuff. Here's another one right here. Uh, yep, here's the earthen wall. Here, coming around like that. 
These are very low to the river. These are they're not that close to the river, but they're very low. They're probably subject to flooding. This is another example of upper terrace houses. We found four to five houses here. Another one nine meters or so above sea level. There were supposed to be five. There's supposed to be another one over here somewhere, but we we could not could not find it. There's dense forest around it. Okay, thanks. I'm uh, I'm not going to have time, but what I'm going to do what I'm going to do is uh, let's see. I'm going to here here's a nice here's a nice house from up there. Okay, like that. I wanted to just close off. Uh, this is this is Nimrod's pool. This is about five kilometers from Grand Falls. There's a lot. There were 53 house pits here. We recovered. Uh, uh, we found about 16 of them. So basically, we, we found between 39 and 46 of 95 house pits that were reported at these three clusters over the years. And this Nimrod's pool is important because it has stone artifacts there as well. And this, these are beaches, beaches point things here. These are dorsal things here. So the Nimrod School, these, these are the ones I showed you earlier, the little passage in Urban Beyond, and the iron stuff. Uh, some of the best quality material, some of the best quality recycled iron comes from Nimrod School. And for some reason, so the Beyond were here before the intensified occupation started. So they go up river and they come back to this place again in the early 19th century to uh, to make these high quality iron things. So these are some of the problems that you know that do that we have to deal with, right? Uh, that we want to, that we that we could be addressing through proper uh, excavation and management of these, of these. I just want to have a couple at the end, but I just want to show you like what happens to places that we don't monitor and whatever, because because uh, these are all hospice from the Emirates pool. Okay, here's uh, here's uh, South Exploits. There were supposed to be ten hospits here. It's a jungle once again. We couldn't find any hospits here. We did find a bit of a of, a, of an external herd. Uh, there had to be houses left there, and the only thing to do is go back here now, probably start here and dig pits every like three meters apart or something like that. That's what we had to do at Aspinall and two, which is one of the sites one of the sites I just flashed through then to find some features that we couldn't find with our uh, with our brief uh, visit that, that that we're sort of obligated to do right here. Uh, so this these are all from from the South Exploit site. Here's Red Indian Lake. Uh, you'd be very interested to find a house that I'm ready in lake these days. This is probably why. Uh, people say since the river was dammed up here in 1927, uh, the lake has risen from 30 feet, right? So basically, for the most part, sites that the people were occupying were over here somewhere, you know. And this is this the like, price of this beach now is up to 40 meters wide, right? So those sites, and there's not unfortunately, it's not as simple as just being flooded, you know. The sites have been destroyed, right? As the erosion has washed away the gravels and whatever. So that's the problem with that. Here's Pope's Point by Badger. Uh, Speck saw four houses here. Deborah said there was three here. She worked here. And there's uh, this is now a, a trailer park. Right? So you know, so without proper management and stuff, uh, and at least I mean they, they could they could have had a trailer park, but if if uh, if that has been uh, archaeologically excavated before that, well then you know we, at least we would know what was going on there. Right? Luckily for this area, there's a bunch of house pits at other sites uh, around here. But still, who was you know? You never know what you're what you're missing, right? Till it's gone. Right? So anyhow, that's where I wanted to end. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone has any questions, I'll turn the lights on uh, because it is a little after three thirty. If anyone has to go, that's that's fine as well. Okay. I'll just turn the lights on. Sorry about going over. <laughs> Any questions from anyone? Yes. So, uh, any idea of how many live years uh, put it in those 95 um, houses? None. Those are Beothic house pits, right? Oh, yeah. And at one point, can you extrapolate and, and guess at how yeah, many? Yeah, but they weren't live years, though. Oh. They weren't live years. Live oh, years they just are. traveled here. Livyers were no, but livyers were fishermen. Stuff, right? No one would use the term livyers for biotic. Give me, give me how many biotic were living in them. Yes. Well, I would, I would, I would think that they were never simultaneously occupied, right? And that, that's, and that's a really interesting question because there's, you know, when you, when I'm on the, when I'm on the shores of the river like that, there's, there's so many houses, you know, and why are there so many houses, really? 
you know, like on the coastline, I mean, you know, you're at the beaches, so there's 18, the boys' boat, there's 11. And most people would argue that even at boys' boat, you never had 11 occupied at the same time, right? So why did they need so many houses up and down the Exploits River like that, you know? Did the, I wonder if the caribou was a more wasteful uh, economy, if, there's, if the houses got dirtier quicker, whatever. You know, so, so it's hard to judge the population. And when Carpenter's up there in 1768, there's some some suggest that there might have been three or four hundred trains, but it's just I know when, uh, people and you, you're you're obliged to estimate, right? And the best and that's why that's another reason why we need to get in there and excavate, <laughs> right? Because then we can we can determine like what seem to be simultaneous occupations and whatever. But we just don't have so I guess we just don't have the information to give a good answer for that. Right? At this point. Uh, just one other quick question. Yeah. You talked about fences for the caribou. Right. So did they kind of corral the caribou so that they had a private stock? If they kind of had them uh, yeah, kept it, in an area. It seems mostly that they were sort of uh, they sort of channeled them towards the river, and as they left the river, perhaps or not. So they probably some people think they killed them in the river, right? Oh, pardon me. They they didn't they, they weren't domesticated, so they probably you know because they were migrating on mass you know in the in the spring and in the fall, and so uh, they they harvested them by the boat over shore. Because when they were eating those houses, they were, it's, it's caribou bones everywhere, you know, and. Uh, Yes, sir. Uh, killing, killing them in the river would have been the most logical. Yeah, that's what a lot of people think, right? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah and if the, the canoes, they, you know, they, they go yeah. by the side and then they right. on the caravan. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been very difficult to catch the Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, but, I mean, they, but if they were channeled properly, too, it seems to me because you're thrusting, right? They're not, you know, they're not, they're not just shooting a gun, right? So when you're when you're thrusting from a you know from a canoe in a river, you're you're on, you're on an unstable sort of basis, right? So I don't know, you know, but I mean a lot of people think they were killed in the river, yeah. A lot of people think it makes sense to kill them in the river, yeah. Well even up until the, the 70s, the wildlife used to corral the caribou that come down off the buckets by fell, that's how they used to tag them. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well yeah, yeah, I guess because you 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 know, it seems like, you know, they're um, well, they're fairly they facilitate hunting, don't they, caribou? I don't know a lot about it. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, uh, what kind of written coordinates were you following? Like what words or signs or stuff were Well, we uh, what we have, like, is, well, before GPS, for example, we would record, like, when I when you look for sites without a GPS, you have a, you take a top of map with you. So you always have to sort of know where you were, right? And when I, when I would, when I would find a site, when I found an archaeological site before GPS, I would bang it in on a top of map. And then I would, uh, when I get back to the to the library, whatever, to my home, with a better map, then I would determine, I guess, you estimate to a degree your 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 latitude and longitude, right, as best you can. And that worked pretty well. Like Steve, what Steve Hall can tell you, like you know, as long as you're being careful and stuff. But like I say, when I was out doing this kind of thing within a GPS, I sort of always knew where I was, you know. And uh, but I think if you're by yourself, you know, uh, without that. Background and whatever, it's, it's easy to make mistakes, right? Because it's darn exciting too when you start flying stuff, right? And the dirt starts to fly and everything else, you know. And, and you think you know, you think you know where that was. You go back there, and, and I think you know sometimes it, it's it's not right, you know. So it, it was it was it was interesting just finding some of these again, you know, and uh, trying to figure it out, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, what are the plans to excavate some of these sites? Well, no, it's. Uh, these are under management of the Provincial Archaeology Office now, right? And so they, uh, I'm not aware, I wouldn't be aware of what they have in mind to do with it, you know. But they, they have been, uh, they're pretty serious about monitoring and whatnot. I, I'm not aware of any plans to excavate, you know. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm always lobbying for that. Because I, cause I'm a consultant, I, I want to go to <laughs> Pardon me? Well, university. Well, it's a hard thing. I, I mean, I don't want to speak for Mon either because they, you know, they always have X number of projects on the go. Right? Yeah, you know, every every academic, every prof has their little area, their little their little empire that they built, whatever. You know, and right now there's no one working in the in the interior, basically, and there's no one focusing on the Beata right now. I mean, uh, when I was doing that one in the 80s, uh, Ralph Pastore, Dr. Ralph Pastore. Uh, uh, well, did a lot of Beothic ex uh, excavations, and and he was the man about you know to go to for the Beothic, right? And right now, I mean, they have they have different uh, 
the different subjects they're pursuing in Labrador and elsewhere in New Flat and stuff too. Yeah. So it's dormant. It's dormant now, yeah. And uh, I expect that, that uh, some rep, some some archaeologists from the from the provincial office will be in there this summer at best to check on some of the sites and see what you know. I mean, and I would think you know, let's say I, I can't speak for them. I would think that if anything, if there's an extreme situation, they'll probably deal with it, uh, like erosion or whatever, something like that. But they're just gathered yeah, dormant now. I want to thank Lori for a very informative talk today. I learned a lot. I saw some of those pictures yesterday, and even today I can't get over the size of some of those trees growing up in the middle of the house pits from the wall. I think if anyone has any additional questions, they could be around for oh, sure. a few minutes. If anyone no has any questions. And also, if anyone wants to know anything about the Newfoundland Labrador Archaeology Society, they have some information here as well. Thank you.